Well, this is Homecoming Sunday, and uh, when you think of home, I think of Bethany Church, and our Bethany Church ministry model is Jesus Built. Jesus Built. If I could sum up what we're talking about to church here, it's Jesus Built. It's really not about us. It's about Jesus, and that he uses the likes of us in order to build his church. It's built on the Great Confession. Remember, uh, Peter said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Then the Lord said, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood is not revealed that to you, but the Father, God, is at work in your life to make the great confession. The great confession is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that's what we want. We want to raise our children to make the great confession. We want to reach our neighbors to share with them our great confession that they might make it too. We are a church built upon the great confession of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're also built on the great commandment. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord gave us that one. I think there's two parts to that. The number one part is worship. You love the Lord God, you worship him. The second one is to love your neighbor. That's a fellowship and outreach. You're reaching out to them. You're loving your neighbor. And so there's two aspects there. The next part of the Great Commission or the Great Commandment is uh, that we're built on. It's the Great Confession, Great Commandment, and the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's why we do our outreach ministries here, including Open Door and The Well, but even bigger than that, that we've sent, we've commissioned and sent the goods to go to Hungary in our behalf because we are fulfilling the Great Commission. We are a Jesus-built church. And today, our text just so happens to focus on the great commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. We're in 1 John, and we've been talking about what you really need to know. And today, it's about what you really know about God's commandment. This is what you really need to know about God's commandment. The first thing I want to say, the commandment is both old and new. Now, that seems like a contradiction in terms. How can it be old and new at the same time? Watch, well, read with me. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is a message that you've heard. Now, if you were to read back through your Old Testament, you would come across in the book of Deuteronomy the expression to love the Lord your God with all your heart. You would find that. It's right there. It's been there the whole time. It was in the law. If you went back a little bit further in the the Old Testament, and you were in the book of Leviticus in chapter 19, you were to love your neighbor as yourself. It was in the Old Testament all along. It's been there from the beginning. It was there. Now, the Jews got so hung up on all the rules and regulations, all the things that you had to do, the little details of the law, that they kind of missed the heart of the law, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So that Jesus is the one who summarizes it. Now, in the next verse, in verse 8, it says, I, yet I am writing you a new command. Okay, you ready for the new command? Its truth is seen in him and you. Here's the new command. A new command I give you, love one another. You say, how can that be new? It was already in the Old Testament. Here's what makes it new. He says, as I have loved you. It's the intensity and the quality of the love. You love like Jesus loved. How did Jesus love? Whoa. Someone said, when Jesus said, I love you, he said, I love you this much. Whoa. That I would die for you. Wouldn't it be amazing if you were in a group of people where you believed with all your heart that everyone would be willing to give their life for you. And that's what the church is to be. That I love everybody in the body of Christ so intensely that I would die for any one of them at any given time. You would feel an overwhelming love, so much so that Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another because you don't find that love in the world. We live in a world of selfies. 
In fact, I took a couple this past week. And when I couldn't, you know, because I'm on the camel, it's a little hard to get the whole camel in. I had my niece do it. So I don't have a picture of me on the camel, but my niece has it, you see. But I have pictures of them on the camel, so we're going to have to trade. But we live in a world of selfies. It's all about me. I did take one really cool selfie. I'm standing up on the 125th floor of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. And there's a sign above it. It says, basically, don't lean on the glass. <laughs> and you know what I'm doing. I'm leaning on the glass, <laughs> taking a selfie. But we are a selfie. It's all about us. Me, 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 me. And it's really unusual to go someplace where the people, it's not about them, but they make it about you. Whoa. Isn't that amazing? And when you find a group like that, you say, I want to be a part of that. And that's what Jesus was saying. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And that's what Bethany Church must be for people to be attracted to us and say, I want to be there and I want to stay. It is my family. It's my family. Love as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is the new part of the commandment. You love like Jesus loves. And he goes on and says, hey, the commandment, it, it's light versus darkness. He says, yet I am writing you a new commandment. Its truth is seen in him and you because darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Whew. We're no longer in the dark. We're no longer in the dark. We're not stumbling around in the dark. The light has shined unto us. We know where we're headed. We're on our way to heaven. We know we've got forgiveness of sin. We're basking in the sunlight of God's love. It's light versus darkness. He said, that's what I'm writing about. Anyone who claims to be in the light, he's got to live in the light. You walk in the light. That's the word for live here. You walk. You, you take your steps. You take your steps in the light. In the light. He goes on and says, anyone who claims to be in the light, but he hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Hate comes in many forms. It can be prejudice. Prejudice because of a skin color. It can be prejudice because of an economic status. It could be, uh, it comes in many forms. An intellectual superiority on your part. You, you, you can't hate your brother. And when you do so, you are still in the darkness. You're not in the light. Why? God demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Very unlovely, very unlikable that he sent Christ to die for us. Jesus died for us while we were sinners. He loved us even when we were unlovely. And so if you have animosity, uh, built up a bitterness and anger, a resentment, a jealousy, something in your heart towards another fellow believer, he says, you're still walking in the dark. But he says, whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Whoa, he's walking in the light. He's walking in the light. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. And he walks around in the darkness. Years ago, <laughs> I was a teenager actually, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I had this dream that in the middle of the night, you know you ever have the dream where it seems so real? I mean, you, you just swear this is real. I had this dream that my parents moved in the middle of the night to a new house. And they didn't even wake me up. They just put me in a new bed. And the new bed was short. I mean, I had to curl up in it because I could feel the top and I could feel the bottom. It was a real short bed. And then I woke up and I felt the top and it was real short. I felt the bottom. I mean, it's, it's pitch black in my room. 
that I'm in, and, and I feel it, and I feel it. I swear they've moved. This is not a dream. It really happened. So I climb over the end of that bed, because it's short, and I start to find my way around this new room I'm in, and I kick something. Oh, I stumble, I flip over, I fall, I finally hit the wall, I grab, I turn on the light switch, I'm in my room, I got in my bed sideways. It was a, a bunk bed, so it no longer is long, but it's short, and I just tripped over the vacuum cleaner that was left out. I was totally disoriented, totally disoriented. He who hates his brother is in the darkness, and he walks around in darkness. You hate your brother, you don't know where you're at in your Christian faith. It affects you in everything in your life. You can't hold bitterness in your heart, resentment, anger, hostility. You can't have any of that in your heart against a fellow believer. He says, he does not know where he's going. I didn't know where I was going. I was in the dark. I thought I was in a dream. But the dream had become reality. I was, all, I was so disoriented. Because he's in the darkness, he says, because the darkness has blinded him. I'm blind to reality. And that is the case of anyone who holds anger, hatred, bitterness, animosity, jealousy, covetousness, all that goes in, their, in his heart towards a fellow believer. Whoa. The commandment of God, it's love versus hate. It's also family versus the evil one. Now this family of God includes the spiritually immature. So John writes, I write to you, dear children, uh, technos is the word here, it's a child, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. In the days that are coming, in our toddler's room, I'm sure they will be singing this little song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I, I think every generation since that thing's been written has been singing that song. We were watching a movie the other night, and in the movie, a secular movie, they were singing that song. Jesus loves me. Why? Because they know it appeals to everyone. Everybody knows that song. Listen, dear children, and I'm hoping in our toddler room that they come to faith early. Because when you come to faith early, you, you have the joy of avoiding a lot of the pitfalls of sin in your life. So that you can live a holy, godly life, and God will one day himself say, well done, good and faithful servant. He says, your sins have been forgiven. They've been let go. They've been released. I accepted Jesus at eight years old. This is amazing. And the day I prayed to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, I felt this huge burden roll away. Come on, I was only eight years old. It wasn't like I was embezzling funds. It wasn't like I was committing adultery. It wasn't like I was eight years old, but I knew I was a sinner. And that burden was rolled away. Listen, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name, not because of me. I realized at that young age, eight years old, Jesus took away my sin. Isn't that amazing? Amen. I love it. God is so good. The family of God includes the immature. It also includes the mature. I write to you fathers. He's talking about them spiritually. Fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. You know Jesus Christ who was in the beginning with God and was God. He is the eternal word of God. You know him. Now the word know here is not that, oh, I know about him. I actually know him and have a relationship with him. I have a relationship with God. That's what a mature Christian is. Someone who has a relationship with the true and living God, Jesus Christ. They don't just know about him, but daily they have a relationship with him. They're a mature person in their faith. Not just head knowledge, heart knowledge. They really know the Lord. He also includes the adolescents. Some of you have been through that. A lot of you have been through that age. And, and those of you who have been through it, aren't you glad you got through that? I've never heard anybody say, I really want to go back and go through those identity struggles. Who am I? What am I doing? What's my purpose in life? But he said, I write you young men because you have overcome the evil one. You know, that's why we have Area 51. 
That's why we have Pastor Dave. He focuses on helping our young people, steering them to the faith and away from the pitfalls of sin and a life without the Savior, but how to live with the Savior and live for the Savior so that they, have, they can overcome the evil one because the evil one is out to destroy us. He has been from the very beginning. He's out to destroy us. He goes on here and he says, and I write to you who are spiritual babies. I write to you, dear children. This word for children is infant. Because you have known the Father. He's including uh, four categories. And he's going to repeat most of them. He says, I'm repetitious here. Fathers. That's a spiritually mature. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. He turns it around and he says, I write to you, young men. You have area 51. Because you are strong and the word of God lives in you. That's a huge part of our area 51 ministry. It's teaching the Word of God. Now, we do a lot of other things. We do big events. We go to Cedar Point. We go on retreats. We do, and that's kind of look to hook. Hook. We got to make it attractive so kids voluntarily want to come. But it's really not about all that. Well, sometimes it seems like that because, I mean, even I go to Cedar Point. I like riding those rides. And Come on, I, I, I've done the, the dragster. Biggest thrill you ever had in nine seconds. <laughs> you wait for two hours for nine second thrill. Whew. Why do you do that? Because it's fun. It's... But the, the bottom line is, it's not about the fun. We want to minister to their eternal, eternality of who they are. We want you to accept Christ and live for Jesus. Because for all eternity, you're going, to spend some play, you're going to be somewhere, either with Christ or without him, either in heaven or in hell. It's of eternal consequence, and we want you to live for him, and not, and not just get there by the skin of your teeth, but we want you to live for Jesus and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to input into your life uh, and so that you are reaching out and touching other people's lives that we fulfill the great commission, that we pass it on to you, and that you'll pass it on to the next generation, that Bethany Church on its homecoming will have a homecoming 20 years from now, 60 years from now, 100 years from now, if the Lord tarries. It's all because we get the word of God into their lives so that they can love the Lord their God with all their heart like everyone who knows Jesus. And he said, not only do you have the word of God, but you have overcome the evil one. We want our young people not to fall into the temptations of the devil, but to learn how to flee from them, flee from him, how to be victorious over him, and live for the glory of God. He turns to the next category, he says, the commandment of God, it's God's love versus the world's love. <laughs> he says, do not love the world. The word world is used in several ways in the Bible. It can be used for planet Earth, the world. It can be used for the population on Earth. For example, for God so loved the world, he's talking about the people, right? The population. And it can be used for the world system. Like we still use it this way today, the world of politics. On the news, it's, oh, now we're going to turn to the world of sports. What do you mean the world? Is there a planet called sports? No, it, it's talking about that system of activities and here he's saying do not love the system of the world that is opposed to God don't fall into that trap or anything in that system of the world if anyone loves that world the love of the father is not in him don't love the world don't love the world for everything in the world then he starts to enumerate them. The craving of the sinful nature, my old nature. The lust of my eyes, the boast of what he has or does, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but it comes from the world. You know what comes from the Father? Well, the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto me according to Romans 5.5. 5. That's what comes from the Father. Not, not this craving all these sinful desires, not boasting about how great or what I have. Not my lust for what everybody else has. That doesn't come from God. 
You see, our adversary, the devil, he uses all of these things against us. It's been from the beginning of time. When Eve was in the garden, the serpent came to him. It was the devil. We know that from the book of Revelation, the serpent, the devil. He came to her, and when the woman saw the tree, he, see, he, was, he told her, you can eat of the tree that God has forbidden, and, and if you, you eat, you'll just be like God because God knows good and evil, and he's holding back on you. And she bought his lie, and she went, it says, and when the, she saw that the tree was good for food, hmm, it'll satisfy my desires, my fleshly desires, my appetite. Then it also says, and that it was a delight to her eyes. It looked beautiful. I, I wanted that fruit that was forbidden. You know how that works. You put a plate of cookies on the table and you tell the child, don't eat them. You turn around to get the milk to go with the cookies and you come back, they're all gone. How can you eat them that fast? You got the idea? There is something, there is seeing, seeing, and I want it. I want it. It was a delight to her eyes, the lust of the eyes. She saw the fruit. It says, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing to her eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, that's the pride of life. It, it, something I can brag about, boast about, make me wise, I'm going to be wise. The text goes on and says, she took of its fruit, she ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. This is what the devil does. He doesn't come around, you know, I always portray him in a red suit, big red horns, you know, because that's the stereotypical that's not the way he comes. In the book of Isaiah, it says he's beautiful. And he comes as an angel of light, glamorous. When he wants to tempt a man, he comes with the most beautiful, gorgeous babe. <laughs> when he wants to touch a, a, a woman, tempt a woman, he comes with such a romantic gentleman. Mm. That's the way he operates. He is doing that today. Listen, he did it even in Jesus' day. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, the tempter came and said to him, said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God. Actually, the way the word if is used there, you could translate it since, because he's acknowledging who he is. Since you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves. Why? He's appealing to the natural desires of your flesh because he'd been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. I don't know when last time you fasted 40 days. I don't see any hands going up. How many of you fasted for 40 days ever? <laughs> Got one. The doctor probably made you. You were unconscious. <laughs> Most I've ever done is 10 days. And I'm telling you that because it wasn't a spiritual thing. It was, uh, I, I, I was involved in a competition with some friends. And anyway, 10 days, 10 days. 40 days, he was hungry. And the tempter comes at the moment you're most vulnerable. Hmm. At your weakest moment. And he says, hey, you're God. You're the son of God. Make those stones turn to bread. <laughs> Jesus, you know, he responded, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He says, listen, I, I don't need real physical food. God will meet my need. Listen, he backs off, comes again, boom. Actually, the, the, the account in Luke says the whole 40 days he had been tempting them. These three are the only ones recorded. Whoa. You ever wonder why you, don't, you only get three? No, you get a lot more than three, don't you? <laughs> It's boom, 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 boom. That same thing. Your, your temptation. Uh, he took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. It's a corner of the temple, the highest point. And he says, hey, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Because he has commanded his angels to take care of you. Come on, prove it. Prove it. It's pride of life. Your life is so valuable. He won't allow you to get hurt. Go ahead, do it, do it. After that temptation, he tempts him again. 
He takes them up to a very high mountain and shows them all the kingdoms of the world. He says, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Here we have the lust of the eyes. He's showing them everything, everything that is under Satan's control at the time. What I'm trying to say is, Satan, the devil, our adversary, uses the same things over and over and over again. And he's using them on you and me every day. Every day. Every day. The next verse says, the world and its desires pass away. This life is so temporary. Remember, I I call it a little dot. It's just a speck. That's your life. It's a vapor. It appears for a little while and vanishes away. But eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. He said, the world and its desires pass away. Your temptation, every time you cave in, like it's, it's gone, whoops, and then you feel guilty. <laughs> That's the way it works. It passes away. But the man who does the will of God, he will live forever. Listen. The man who does the will of God, you do what the Bible says. That's what Jesus did. Jesus refuted every temptation with the Bible. In the Greek text, it says it is written. It literally says it stands written. It was written a long time ago, and it's still effective right now. The word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he kept quoting scripture, 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 scripture. That's why it is so important you memorize scripture. I'm honest, I don't don't memorize as much as I used to. And some of you haven't memorized any more since the year we had a verse every month to memorize. We might do that again in 22. What do you think? A verse, verse a month. We all work on it together. We memorize that verse that month, and at the end of the year, we at least have 12 verses under our belt. Right? so, So that when... When a temptation comes to you, you know, years ago I was so angry. I, I had an angry streak in me. You know, the beloved John was called the son of thunder because he had an angry streak in him. And, and God turned that and made him the beloved, a, a man of love, and he champions love. He uses the word love more than anybody else in the New Testament, love. I had this anger streak in me, and I said, i got to deal with this. So I went to the Word of God, and I found some scriptures Man's wrath does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. The fool gives full vent to his anger, but the righteous man keeps himself under control. And every time I'd feel that, that need to get angry, I'd just quote that verse to myself, and it was amazing how it all just subsided. Sometimes I had to pull myself out of the situation because it was making me so angry. I'd open up my wallet where I had my verse, and I'd read that verse, and that verse would just remind me. And you get to the point, you read it enough times, you got it memorized. You do know that, right? That's why you post it and you read it and you reread it. Listen, Jesus refuted all the temptations from the devil, every single one, with a scripture. And you can too. You can too. Because the person who does the will of God, he says, lives forever. I don't know. I, I, people said, you know, you need to replace the escalator into the sky with something else. And I've been thinking about putting an elevator with a button. It says up. Up. A day is coming when I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm going up. So the commandments of God, what should we take away from this whole idea that we want to do God's commandments? God's commandments, first of all, are are not burdensome. They're, They're not burdensome. Some people think about, well, Christian. I wouldn't want to become a Christian because, man, they lose all the fun. They, they, don't, they don't do all the fun things. It's not like I got a list of things I, I, that I do and I don't have to do. It, it's not like I operate like that. God changed me when I became a Christian from the inside out. He changed my heart. I don't love the things the devil loves. I don't love the things that the world loves. I don't love them any longer. So slowly, I've changed. I just don't want to do that anymore. The person who was cursing and love finds Jesus, all of a sudden they realize, hmm, I used to curse, but I don't curse anymore. Why? 
Because there's a rule on that? No, because I love Jesus and I don't want any corrupt communication coming out of my mouth. The person who was drunk, uh, drunk before loves Jesus, loves Jesus, and they say, well, you know, I know the Bible says be filled with the Spirit, not with, don't be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. I love Jesus, so I want to be filled with the Spirit. And the more I'm filled with the Spirit, the less I care to be drunk. I'm changed from the inside out. The person, you just name it, whatever it is. I, it's, it's kind of like when, you, when you're married. When you're married, you, may, you had a legal contract. And a legal contract bound the two of you together. The only way you can get out is you either kill the spouse, I mean, they die, or, or <laughs> you get a divorce. That's the only way out. You're legally bound. So why do you keep faithful? Because I got a contract or because you love your spouse? You love your spouse. And because you love your spouse, you're not interested in anyone else. When you love Jesus, you keep the contract because you love him with all your heart. Does that make sense? You will naturally do the law and fulfill it even though you're not trying because you just love Jesus. You just love Jesus. When you just love Jesus and you live for Jesus, you will begin to do the will of God even if you didn't know it was the will of God because you love him and you're doing the right things for him. Wow. God's commandments are not a burden. They're, they're light for your soul. You say, whoa, the Lord wants me to love my neighbor and I've been loving my neighbor. Man, I must be a child of God. This is great. I love, I love the Lord. I love my neighbor. I have love for other people. You know, I used to, this person used to annoy me and, and it just bugged the daylights out of me. And, and I've taken a whole different approach to them. And God has opened my eyes that they have a need that I didn't know of. And that's why they behave the way they behave. And you know what? I'm going to minister to that person. Isn't this amazing? This is the way it works. The commandment, why? Because I love one another. I fulfill the commandment of God. It's family friendly. I realize that, hey, you know, I don't give a first grader a college exam all right i don't expect i expect from a new believer a baby believer a baby life i don't expect spiritual maturity of a person who is 40 50 years old in their faith i don't and i shouldn't i love that person where they're at it's family friendly the, the, the this whole commandment of god so it, it shows the divine love of god God's love is wrapped up. There's not, there's not a command that he has given that was not in our best interest. Not a single one. Every single one is in our best interest. And when I love the Lord, I'll do them because they flow from my heart of love. And they represent God's will. The commands of God, they all represent his will. It's what he wants for our lives. And you know what? John is writing to tell us, hey folks, you really need to know this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. <laughs> you'll fulfill the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. You'll fulfill the law. It's that simple. Christianity is a religion of love. Every other religion is one of works. Works. Christianity is a religion of grace. Grace. God giving you what you don't deserve. Every other religion is you trying to work your way to appease a God. Christianity is your appeasement has already taken place in Jesus Christ's sacrifice because he loves you. Oh, there it is, love again. And every other one, God is out to get you, so you better behave. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be a Christian and love the Lord with all your heart? Love the Lord. See, he wants you to know that. God loves you. Love him back. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do love you. And we know from the God, uh, this first epistle of John that we only love you because you first loved us. You loved us while we were yet sinners and you sent your son to die for us and save us. And if there's someone here who's never accepted Jesus or online listening, never accepted Jesus, I pray, Lord, right now that they would pray and say, Lord, save me. I acknowledge I'm a sinner and I need you as my Savior. 
Make me a child of God. I know that you will do it, Lord. Simple prayer of faith. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's your gift, Lord, that you give when we have that faith. Save even now. And Lord, for us who know you, may we realize today that the law is fulfilled by our love. When we love you and we serve you, we focus on you, we will naturally do what the, what the law requires. Without even trying, it will flow from our heart. Help us to put our heart fixed on you, that we so fulfill the law of God, that you are pleased with us because we do the will of God. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.